I want to remind you that as we come to the book of Amos, you are dealing with a man whose name means burden. I want you to remember that Amos is a partner along with others. He is um, speaking along the same time of Jeroboam II, which is 790s to 750s BC. And uh, you will remember that the prophets that are part of the divided kingdom period, and I'm talking about writing prophets, not speaking prophets. There are speaking prophets like Elijah and Elisha uh, and Nathan the seer, uh, Idu the seer. There are many of them. But the writing prophets will include Obadiah, who's writing to Edom, uh, Joel, we looked at a little earlier, Amos appears to come along at about this time, Jonah, we looked at this prophet as well, and then the triad of Isaiah, Micah, and Hosea that are all teaming up at about the same time. Remember, there are seven... Uh, Seven, <laughs> I'm good in math. There are seven, uh, there are, remember that there are seven prophets for that divided kingdom period, followed by the three prophets that are in Judah alone, which are Habakkuk, uh, Zephaniah, and Nahum or Nahum. So I want to I just quickly look at, in the next few minutes, a little bit of the prophecy of Amos. Now, it is written in three boxes or three sections. The first one is in one 1 to 2, 16, or chapters 1 and 2. The second one is in chapters 3 to 6, and then, of course, 7 to 9. And what I'm doing with these are breaking them down between the types of prophecies that they are. The first uh, two chapters include eight indictments, and those indictments will largely be to kingdoms around uh, Israel, zeroing in on Israel. This is what it is. It'll begin with Damascus, and then it'll move around to Gaza. It'll move around to Tyre. It'll move around to um, the Edomites. It'll move around to um, uh, Ammon and Moab, and then eventually to Judah, and end up zeroing in on Israel. It's actually done this way. My map isn't exactly to scale, but you get the idea of it. What he's doing is a post-World War II term, zeroing in, because of the Japanese zeros that used to aim at our ships in the Pacific. What he's doing is he's closing in on the bullseye, but he's aiming at uh, Judah and Israel, and primarily at Israel. So this is a divided kingdom period between 928, 722. There is an Israel in the north. There is a Judah in the south. It's after Solomon, but before the, uh, the fall of the northern kingdom to the Assyrians. All right. The judgments are largely going to be indictments about, you can see, we get to number six of the eight without getting to Jews. So six of the eight indictments that are found in chapters 1 and 2 are not about the Jewish people, but about people that affect the people uh, uh, of God. And you don't get to the Jewish people until you get to number 7, which is Judah, and number 8, which is Israel. So if you take a look at the book, you'll find that these, um, this zeroing in is all about bringing you down to understanding the national shame that is, here's the world around us and what we were to be to them. But instead of us being to them, they have now made us like them. In other words, we've been pressed into the mold of the world. And because we have, we now will bear a shame, and that shame will be carried out to all people. The next section that we're going to look at has three oracles, and the oracles are oracular uh, visions or pronouncements, you need to see that in the beginning box, there are eight indictments, and the people of God were pressed into the mold of the world rather than affecting the world. In the second box, there are three specific 
oracular warnings. One of them is that Israel is going to be chastised, the first one. The second one is that um, they've ignored my warnings. And the third one is a lamentation with two great woes. And you're going to see this picked up later on in Revelation, the sound of these, whoa, whoa. To the these are specific sermons that have been pasted together in the center of the book that are to tell you about three, let's say three sermons instead of three oracles, and you'll get the same idea. Then at the end, in 7 through 9, we're going to see five specific <laughs> visions. And those five visions include a vision where he sees in 7, 1 to 3, a series of locusts. And uh, followed by another one, seven, four to, I think it's four to six. Yeah, seven, four to six, which is a vision of fire. A third vision comes up, but not until there's a bit of an interlude. There's a bit of an interlude from seven, 10 to 17. So I'm going to set that aside, seven, 10 to 17. And we're going to box that off. That's going to be an interlude. And by the time you get to 7, 18, I'm sorry, it's 8, 1. It's not 7, 18. There is no 7, 18. By the time you get to 8, 1, to I think it's 14, if I'm not mistaken, 8, 8 1 to 14, you'll see a summer fruit. Now, all of this right now is just blah, 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 but it's going to make sense as we weave the thing together. First, you need to get a, an embracing of what it is he's doing, and then you can just sort of weave it together into its spiritual outline. Chapter 9 will be a, um, a picture of the Lord before the altar. The pl there's a third one, which is plumb line, and that is 7, 7 through 9. And then you have the insert. So one, two, three, four, five different visions that he's going to have. What I'd like to do is stop for a second. I want you to have those in the beginning of your notes, but then I want to walk through this book quickly and see if we can pick up really what is he trying to do. I'm going to take a special light brush to some part of the narrative because I don't think it's actually going to help us a great deal to spend a lot of time discussing what God is going to do to the Edomites. They are dust. They're gone, okay? And with Obadiah, you got a pretty good stomping of the Edomites. So what I'm going to do is just kind of walk through it with you. And starting off in the very first um, verse, you have the superscription of it, that these are the words of one whose name is Burden, Amos, who was among the sheep herders of Tekoa. Tekoa is near Bethlehem. It's southeast of Bethlehem. And for those of you who travel with me, you will be able to see Tekoa. We can point it out from the top of the Herodian. It is a modern city uh, today that is under construction right next to the ancient place of Tekoa. And we have, in addition to that, it says that he was among the sheep herders from Tekoa, which he envisioned, envisioned in visions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. There's a lot of ideas about when that could be. It's a little bit difficult for us to understand the historical situation of it in uh, completion. All we know is that it's sometime during the 8th century BC and that this significant earthquake was something that everyone knew about at that time, but not necessarily something that we can date accurately today. One of the problems with the, the uh, Middle East is that the way they tell time is often done in a... Um, in a relative chronology. So it's the third year of King of Ahasuerus, which only helps you if you know when King Ahasuerus was king. This is two years after the earthquake, uh, or two years before the earthquake, which only helps you if you happen to know when the earthquake was. So when we begin, let's take a look at what he says. He starts off with a very simple vision, and the vision is a judgment on nations that begins in verse 3. But notice verse 2 sets up the sense or the tenor of the whole argument. He says, the Lord roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he utters his voice, and the shepherds pasture grounds mourn, and the summit of Carmel dries up. Stop. Look what he says. He says, from out of the city of the great temple of God, God is speaking, and he utters his voice, and two things happen. One of them is in the south, and one of them is in the north. 
the south and east where the shepherds pasture, they, their grounds mourn. That is, there seems to be, two years before the earthquake, a lessening of even the necessary rains for the wilderness to produce enough for the sheep to graze upon. So he says, it appears as though there's a drought in the land that's causing a famine, and the shepherds are groaning because their sheep don't have enough to eat. That's in the southeast. That's going to be down here. That's going to be Judah. But then he says, the summit of Carmel, which will be up there in Israel. And he says, the summit of Carmel dries up. You remember from studying the land that there are two rules of rainfall. North and west is wet, south and east is dry. That means that the further north you get, color it more green on your map. The further south you get, color it more brown. The further toward the Mediterranean Sea in the west, color it more green. The further to the south and east, color it more brown. And remember, the second rule of rainfall is high in elevation is wet, low in elevation is dry. So the north and west is wet, but it's also the highest point along the northwest coast, which is where Mount Carmel sticks out. It gets the most natural rainfall. Conversely, south and east is dry, and the Dead Sea is the lowest point. It's both south and east and low, and that means color it completely brown, less than seven inches of rainfall. So you're going to have about four and a half inches of rainfall, and as a result, it's going to be like dry, like Arizona desert. So expect that in this small, 50 miles across here, you're going to go from green rain to brown dry, all in one small compass. Now, what's important is he mentions a place in verse 2 that is south and east, Judah. Next to shepherds, I would put Judah. And summit of Mount Carmel, I would put Israel, because that's what he's doing. He's zeroing in, and he's going to tell you where I end will be about the Jewish people and about what God's effect is on the Jewish people roaring from Zion. You guys have gotten me upset. So don't lose that verse 2 sets up the narrative to tell you that what Amos' burden is, is ultimately not about how bad ungodly people are in the nations, but how bad it's been for the, for the people of God to emulate them, to be pressed into the mold of the world. That's going to be his angle. Now, very quickly, he's going to pick up first a judgment against Damascus and Aram. So I want you to circle in verse 3, Damascus. Three transgressions of Damascus, and for four I will not revoke punishment. This is a poetic way of saying, I want to tell you some things, and, and he repeats it, but he adds or ups the ante on the number to let you know how strongly he feels. I will, I will not revoke its punishment, because they threshed Gilead with implements of sharp iron. They went through and harmed the Israelites that lived on the east side of the Jordan in Bashan and Gilead, and specific in Gilead. So from over here, they came and attacked those who were um, the, uh, the tribes of the east, and they used some kind of metal implements. Then it says, so I will send fire upon the house of Hasiel, and I will consume the citadels of Benadad. I will also break the gate bar of Damascus, cut off the inhabitant from the ba valley of Avon, and, and him who holds the scepter of Beit Aden, so the people of Aram will be exiled to Kir. He says, I am going to have them taken over. They're going to be overthrown and walked out of where they are. All we know about Kir is that it's a southern Babylonian exile point. He says Damascus is going to end up in exile. I don't want to spend a long time on Damascus, but can I point out to you that verses 6 through 8 belong specifically to Gaza, and I know that because you can circle the word Gaza in verse 6. And it says that, again, three transgressions of Gaza, for four I will not revoke its punishment because they deported an entire population to deliver it to Edom. Here's what I want you to see. It looks like I would put next to uh, verse 6, C Obadiah, and that seems to be the same um, time period a little bit later, and he says, God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move against you. I will send fire upon the wall of Gaza. I will consume her citadels. I will cut off the inhabitants of Ashdod. You see Ashkelon. You see Ekron. These are all part of the Philistine pentathlon. You remember there are five cities of the Philistines? Gaza, Gath, Ekron, 
uh, Ashdod, Ashkelon. Those five cities are Philistine pentathlon. And so he's going to turn against the people of the Philistines. Now, in verses 9 and 10, he switches gears. Now he's gone from Damascus to Gaza. His third group in verse, uh, verse um, 9 and 10 will be to the kingdom of Tyre. Can you see in verse 9, circle the word Tyre? And again, the same formula for three things they've done, for four, I won't revoke judgment, because they delivered an entire population to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. So I'll, I will send fire upon the wall of Tyre, I will consume her citadels. And uh, we could talk about the judgment that actually happened to Tyre. It was a profound judgment so that when Tyre was destroyed, it was almost unrecognizable for hundreds of years until it was archaeologically excavated. Um, it's an interesting city because it thought itself to be impregnable and it was actually brought low and destroyed. But again, I don't want to spend a long time on the, on the other guys. I want to get to us. So let's drop down and say in verses 11 and 12, let's circle in verse 11, Edom. And you are already familiar with the judgments against Edom. So just put next to it, see Obadiah, because that's exactly what God is going to do. And he mentions in, um, in verse, um, verses 11 and 12, uh, Edom and Edomite places like Timon and Bozrah. These are places in the Edomite Red Mountains. Now, drop down to verse 13, 13 to 15, and he talks about what kingdom. You see it. In verse 13, circle Ammon, the Ammonite kingdom. This is the area around uh, where the Jordanian king today has his capital. And uh, this is the Ammonite kingdom. And the Ammonite kingdom northeast of the Dead Sea, roughly. Um, th remember, we have a hard time with the boundaries because it's where the people move back and forth. And it depends upon where they're encamped and who, who flexes what as to what their kingdom edges are. But it says that in verse 13, the three transgressions of Am Ammon, and for four I will not revoke its pu punishment. Look what they did. They ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to enlarge their borders. In other words, they so came against the people that they actually harmed not just warriors, but they actually went into villages and harmed people. And then it says, I will kindle a wall, the wall of Rabbah. This would be the capital city of Ammon. Today, the Amman Jordan is in the roughly the same area as, as this, and it will consume their citadels amid war cries in the day of battle and a storm in the day of the tempest. Their king will go into exile, he and his princes together, says the Lord. So you get a sense that you get all the way to the end of chapter 1, and then he's going to switch gears now into another indictment. This is the indictment against who, according to verse 1 of chapter 2? Moab. So circle Moab. And again, you have the same for uh, three transgressions. For four, I will not revoke punishment. He burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. What you see is God saying, look, the way you nations have behaved one against the other have been incredibly destructive, incredibly offensive, and your warfare against one another has not been ignored by God. And so he says, I will send fire on Moab, I will consume the citadels of Keriot, and Moab will die amid tumult and war cries and the sound of a trumpet. I will cut off ju the judge from her midst and slay all her princes. I'm going to take away everything that is rational about her society and break that society down, and I'm going to take it away. And then you get to verse 4. And chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, now you get to Jews. And finally, you get to Judah. And in the um, seventh of the eight indictments in verses four and five of chapter two, it says, I will, uh, it says three transgressions of Judah for four, I will not revoke its punishment because they rejected the law of the Lord, because they have not kept his statutes, because their lies have led them astray. Look at those three things. They rejected God's law. Jerusalem, the voice of God, the temple says, you don't follow my word. Second, you don't keep my, and the word statutes, of course, is that word from hok, it's from the word hogim, it's the word for engravings. You have not only turned away from the specifics of my law, you've turned away from the principles they're founded on, the unchanging truths that are ever true about me. You've walked away from those. 
And then he says, your lies have led you astray. That is, you have written a different way of explaining life and now followed that. But here's what he's saying. He's saying, when you decide as a country that you're going to write a narrative that's not my word and replace my word with a narrative, then here's what you're going to do. Your lies will lead you astray. When you create the there is no creator, we came from random stardust in an explosion out of nothing, then you will create a, ma a morality formed on that lie. And that will lead you astray in your policy. And so ultimately, what Judah had done was taken the brain trust repository of God's revelation, turn it off. And when you turn it off, in the absence of truth, lies fill the vacuum. So I will send fire upon Judah, consume the citadels of Jerusalem for three transgressions of Israel. Go to verse 6. And when you get down to verses 6 to 16, we now focus in the judgment of Israel. For three transgressions of Israel and for four, uh, uh, I will not revoke its punishment. Look at the first one. What did they do? Because you sell the righteous for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. In other words, you take people that aren't doing wrong and you turn them into paupers and clean them out. You steal from those who you can steal from. You take advantage in injustice from those who can't fight back. Then he says, these who pant after the very dust of the earth on the head of the helpless. These are the people who have absolutely nothing and you take what they do, do have. You break them, break them, break them and take and take and take. A good picture of this would be the rounding up of slaves in Africa to drag them across the ocean. The little bit that they had was taken and ripped from them and you made them into slaves. It's that same idea. Now, it's interesting because verse 7 goes on and says, also, you turn aside the way of the humble. That is, the word humble, anav, is the word for a meek person. You put people into the defensive position that aren't doing anything wrong. One of the things that happens when a nation turns its back on God is it makes people who walk with God suddenly become defensive. They don't want to be defensive. They want to be peaceable. The wisdom from above is at first peaceable, James says. But the problem is, when you're getting punched all the time, you've got to raise your hands or you're just going to get your nose broke. So he says, you're, you're turning aside the meek people. You're making them fight back. And it says, and a man and his father resort to the same girl in order to profane my holy name. What you're doing is changing the basic pattern of morality so that mor morality as it regards relationships is being canceled. These are God's people. They're not to be doing this. On garments taken as pledges, they stretch out beside their altar, and in their, uh, their house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Here's what he says. Do you understand verse 8? They take as pledges, they stretch out beside every altar. He's talking about the fertility shrines. He's talking about the practices, the immoral practices that they have now made and codified into religious truth. When you can take something that God says is abhorrent to him and turn it into a religious practice that's supposed to make God happy, you have gone full circle. And then he says, um, verse 9, yet... It was I who destroyed the Amorite before them. Though his height was like the height of the cedars and he was as strong as the oaks, I even destroyed his fruit above and his, his root below. I took out the entire tree of the Amorites for doing the very things you're doing. We have to remember that when people claim to rewrite morality in the name of Jesus Christ and become just like the world, they will walk around in the name of love and say, yes, but God called us to love. But what they're doing are the same sins that caused the destruction of the societies before them. It was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt. I led you into the wilderness 40 years that you might take possession of the land of the Amorite. I raised up some to be sons of prophets and to be the young men, to be Nazarites. Is this not so, O sons of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine. What's he talking about? 
Remember number six and the whole um, benediction to the uh, following the Nazarite uh, vow. And he says, what's the big point of the Nazarite vow? You can't touch grapes. You can't touch vines. You don't eat grape leaves. You don't touch anything that has to do with the grape. And you're making them drink wine. That is, you're taking the holy things that I have made and perverting them. And you commanded the prophets, saying, you shall not prophesy. One of the things that happens in a kingdom that turns its back on God's word is they will pervert God's word. They will push God's people to be in the mold of the world where they will tell them to shut up. You're going to live and see this. You're going to walk through a time when the nation is going to turn to you and say, either shut up or get on board with the morality that we said and put Bible verses after it and make it your church's stand. That's what they do. Let's look at the phrase in verse 13. Uh, Behold, I am weighted down beneath you as a wagon. This is an important thing because um, this is the word for I'm tottering, I'm I'm. Uh, weebles wobble, okay? I'm, I'm wobbling back and forth under the weight of what you are putting on me. I am weighted down. I'm tottering because a, a wagon, like a wagon that is overfilled with sheaves, flight will perish from the swift, and the stalwart will not strengthen his power, nor the mighty man save his life. He who, gas- uh, he who grasps the bow will not stand his ground. The swift of foot will not escape, nor will he who rides the horse save his life. Even the bravest among the warriors will flee naked in that day, declares the Lord. Let's put a word next to that. Judgment. I'm going to judge. And I'm going to judge my people, and I'm going to judge them because of the things that they have done. Because in the, in the uh, 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 southern kingdom, they have allowed even the righteous to be led into captivity, and they've set aside the morality of the word. And in the northern kingdom, they have forced people into a religious prostitution of truth in such a way that I'm going to, I'm going to take even your strongest people and knock them down. All right, let's step back and look at this box. This box is... I have dealt with the fact that the nations around you are evil. I have dealt with them largely in how they deal with one another. I need you to focus on something for a minute. Jesus said when the Son of Man comes, he'll separate the sheep from the goats, and the standard of judgment will be on the nations as to how they treated his people. What's interesting is when God holds nations that are not his people responsible, he largely holds them responsible in the judgment of works based on their moral and equitable relationship with the other nations around them. In other words, what God sees is how does this nation behave against this other nation? Have you decided to walk rightly toward your neighbors? God gives lighter punishments to nations that are pagan but don't harm anybody. I'm thinking of Switzerland. <laughs> you know, they, you know, we don't fight. And so God has lesser judgment on nations that won't engage in harming others. Now, if in fact Switzerland does economic harm through a series of moves, then he would judge that. But when it comes to his people, his people are not judged just how they behave with other nations. In fact, when you look in chapter 2, his turning against his own people were about how they related to him, not so much how they related to the world. He said, you've acquiesced to the world and therefore don't relate to me and my word properly. Let me say it this way. Cut all the way through the first box. God has one standard of judgment for the lost person. He has a standard, obviously there's two judgments for every individual, judgment of sin and a judgment of works. Judgment of sin for me was done at the cross and I will stand before the bema seat of Christ for a judgment of works. For the unbeliever, judgment of sin, he will stand before and he will have to pay for his own sin because he chose not the gospel. But his judgment of works will largely be in how he related to other people. That is not the standard of judgment for the Bema Seat of Christ, nor is it the standard of judgment for the believer. The believer's standard of judgment is, how did I relate primarily to God and his word? So that I, if I have a love for God, if I have a hunger for God, if I desire his word and want to live it out, let me say it as clearly as I can. In scripture, 
a person who wants to walk with God isn't loyal and faithful to their spouse just for their spouse. They're loyal and faithful to their spouse because of their Lord. That's why it's an interior thing, not just an exterior thing. That's why it goes all the way to how I think, not just what I touch. You understand? So God's standard for the believer is higher or lower? Higher, much higher. And it has to do with their interactions with him. All right, let me very quickly move to the center section and let's deal with the oracles. Oracle number one is in the beginning of chapter three. You're going to notice something about chapter three, and that is that the oracles themselves are arranged in a way that um, looks poetic because they are, in fact, poetry. So it says, hear this word which the Lord has spoken against you. This speech, actually the word devar is here, the speech which the Lord has spoken against you, sons of Israel. Now, underline sons of Israel, because what he says is, I am turning to the northern kingdom, I am turning to the Jewish people in that northern kingdom, and against the entire family which he brought up from the land of Egypt. Now, who did he just include? Judah, the southern kingdom is in here. So all of the Jewish people, and he goes on and he asks them, he opens up and he, and he offers them a very strict, very tight, very, um, very forward statement of judgment. Very quickly, look at it. He says, I chose you among the families of the earth, verse 2. Do two men walk together unless they have uh, made an appointment? He says, he says, uh, you know, if you're going in a different direction, are you walking with me? Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion growl from his den unless he has captured something? What is it that you're growling about and speaking of when, when you, don't, you don't have what you're proclaiming? Let me say it this way. You cannot give that which you do not possess. You cannot be a testimony of a God you do not love. Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there's no bait in it? How stupid would that bird have to be to drop right into the trap? I mean, it would be like, why put bait on the hook? Just throw the hook out there and let the fish bite the hook. Because the fish isn't that stupid. If a, if a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people tremble? If a calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? He's asking a series of questions that should all be affirmative. When the trumpet blows, people get excited. A war is coming. A, a battle's coming. Yes. When calamity comes, is it not the Lord? What's the answer to the question? Yes, of course. Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets, a Lord has a lion has roared. Uh, will will not the those who fear the Lord God has spoken? Who can but prophesy? He's not saying in verse seven that God always communicates everything He's doing. That's not what He's saying. He's making a point. He's trying to say, I've got a word from God, and you better pay attention to it. Proclaim on the citadels in verse 9 in Ashdod and the citadels in the land of Egypt and say, assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria and see the great tumult, tumults within her and the oppressions of her midst. But they do not know how to do what is right, declares the Lord, those who hoard up violence and devastation in their citadels. He says, I want you to go out to the borders of the kingdom and I want you to tell them about what's going to happen in the kingdom and I want you to tell them that what's going on in the kingdom isn't righteous. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an enemy, even one surrounding the land, will pull down your strength from you and your citadels will be looted. So he goes on and says, just as the shepherd snatches from the lion's mouth a couple of legs or the piece of an ear, so will the sons of Israel dwelling in Samaria be snatched away. What is that picture? What is the picture? You snatch away a few legs or the piece of an ear out of a lion what, what does that tell you? Remnant. It's a remnant, but the animal's dead. You're only getting what's left over. He said, it's going to come. I'm going to judge you so completely that there'll only be little tiny pieces left. And, and he goes on and he really, he goes on, go down to verse 15. He says, I will smite the winter house together with the summer house. 
The houses of ivory will also perish. The great houses will come to an end. He's saying, I want a complete and to I want you to hear me. Israel is about to be ripped to shreds and I want the people around them to know that it's because inside of us we were already rotted. That's the first of the oracles. And then he says, now hear this word. Look at verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. This is a, a second oracle. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan. Cows of Bashan. Um, in the upper area of the Golan Heights are the best fed cows in the country. You fat cows. You who are in the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness. Behold, the days are coming when, when they will take you away with meat hooks and the last of you with fish hooks. Enter Bethel and transgress and Gilgal. Multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices early morning, your tithes every three days. He says, bring it on, all your false sacrifices. Bring on your false religion because it's going to come down on your head. You love to do so, so says the Lord. But I gave you also cleanness of teeth in the cities and lack of bread in all your places. Cleanness of teeth is not that they got crest. Cleanness of teeth is that they had nothing to eat. I brought you famine. I brought you a lack of bread. And yet you have not returned. Would you underline at the end of verse 6 the heart of the second oracle, which is, I spoke, you're not listening. There are going to be people who are going to stand at the time of judgment and accuse God of not being clear. God, how was I supposed to know you? And God will easily be able to say, well, here are the following radio stations that carried the gospel your entire life that beamed right into your living room. Here were the number of churches surrounding you that you drove by on the way to work. Here were the three believers that spoke into your life. And each time you said, I don't care, I'm busy in my life. The oracle is, in the beginning, that Israel was going to be judged. But the second oracle is, I need you to understand you've ignored every warning I've sent to you. And because of that, your warnings will run out. Now, let's go to the last of the oracles. Oh, one of, the, one of the great, great verses, I can't skip this one. Go down to ch uh, chapter 4, verse 12. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Just underline that one. That's, that's a worthy statement. Get ready for God's coming. Because, behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts, he who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. I would put a box around verse 13. It's one of the great theological self-disclosures of Scripture. He says, I just want you to know, I am not at all shaken by your disobedience. I happen to walk with bigger footprints than you can imagine. What's interesting to me is when you get into to the last one of these, look at the format of some woes. I want you to see that in 5.1, he calls this a dirge. Do you know what a dirge is? Kina, it's the word for a, a lamentation or the song of those following the dead body as they go to the funeral. So this is, hear this word which I take up to you as a dirge, O house of Israel. In other words, I'm walking as a pallbearer, and Israel is the corpse. She has fallen. She will not rise again, the virgin Israel. She lies neglected on her land. There is none to raise her up. Now, is he saying they're done and the Jews are done? No. He's saying that the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom as a kingdom, is done, and it will never again be replaced. The Jews will come back. And he will gather back those from both north and south. And Jeremiah is clear in Jeremiah 37 that he will do that. But they will never again establish that kingdom they called Israel in the northern kingdom. That's gone. It's gone forever. Thus says the Lord God, the city which goes forth a thousand strong will have a hundred left. And the one which goes forth a hundred strong will have ten left to the house of Israel. My point is that when you go down to 518, you pick up 
some woes. There are two woes in the passage. One of them is 518 to 27, and the second one is 6, 1 to 14. 518 to 27, and 6, 1 to 14. In 518, listen to this. Woe, alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not light. And when a man flees from a lion and a bear meets him or goes home, leans on his hand against the law and a snake bites him, will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer to me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them and I will not even look at your peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the sound of your harps. Let justice roll down like the waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Did you present me with sacrifices and grain offerings in the wilderness for 40 years, O house of Israel? You also carried Sekut your king and Kiyun your images, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will make you go into exile beyond Damascus. That's the road that leads to Assyria says the Lord, whose, na whose name is the God of hosts. Uh, by the way, Tzeveot is the word, the God of hosts is the, it's, sometimes it's Sabaoth in the hymnal, Lord Sabaoth, his name. Tzeveot is the God of armies. Here's what he says. He says, you guys think the day of the Lord is all going to be about blessing, but you don't understand. There's a part of the day of the Lord that is very much about judgment. And light of the day of the Lord comes after the darkness. That's the pattern here. I want you to put next to verse 18 of chapter uh, 5, right next to it, 1 Thessalonians 4, 12 through 18. And the day and night, we're going to pick up the day and night of the day of the Lord later. But remember to the Hebrew thinker, the day begins in darkness but ends in light. The darkness precedes it. First Thessalonians 4, 12 through 18. 13 through 18, if you want. Okay? All right. Now, there's the, the second woe. The first woe is, you think that the day of the Lord's going to all be peachy, keen. It's not. The day of the Lord is going to come, and you're going to get stomped first in judgment. Now, he doesn't say that's the whole day of the Lord, but he does say that that's included. One of the reasons is prophet after prophet kept talking about their, the ending place being consolation and comfort. And so people emphasize, look, is there anybody here who doesn't know people are selective hearers? People hear the part that blesses them, not the part that, that makes them responsible. And so he says, you've missed part of the story. Chapter 6, verses 1 to 14 he says, let me give you a second woe. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure in the mountain of Samaria, the distinguished men of the foremost of nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to Kalne and look and go over from there to Hamat the Great. He's talking about places north of Damascus away from or heading toward Assyria. And he says, they go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are they better than these kingdoms? Or is your territory greater than yours? I want you to drop down to one phrase that's going to capture this whole thing in verse 8. The Lord God has sworn by himself. The Lord God of hosts has declared. Here's the phrase I want you to underline. I loathe the arrogance of Jacob. I detest his citadels. I loathe the arrogance of Jacob. See, the second woe is... I think you guys are walking around and thinking that because of David mentioned up in verse 5, I think that because you sing the songs of David and because you have the worship of Solomon's temple, you're walking around strutting your stuff like I'm not going to end it. I loathe your arrogance. All right, so what do we have? We've got the indictments of the people around Israel, then the indictments of the Jewish people specifically. And the standard is different between the two. Then we have three oracles. Israel is about to be chastised, number one. Israel has ignored my warnings, number two. Number three, lament, uh, lamentation. I want you to lament the reality. Woe number one is you think that the judgment of God isn't coming and what's coming is comfort and consolation. And I'm telling you the day of the Lord comes in darkness before it comes in light. Second woe, 
I loathe your arrogance. I don't want to hang out with you anymore. The way you behave, you think because you sing and dance songs that include my name and you stand there with your Bic lighter and you're desperate for me that you, you think I can't see your heart. You're not desperate for me. You're desperate for more money. You're desperate for a better boyfriend. You're desperate for a better car. You're desperate for things that are about you, not about me. And I loathe your arrogance acting like you can put my name on your greed. And then he says in verses 7 and chapter 7 through 9, I want to give you five quick pictures. I want you to circle in verse 1 of chapter 7, locust swarm. Then circle in verse, five, uh, verse 4, the word fire. Then circle in verse 7, plumb line. Then circle in verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, summer fruit. And then go all the way to chapter 9, verse 1, and circle Lord standing beside the altar. These are the pictures. These five visions. And his first vision is all about locusts. The Lord God showed me Behold, he was forming a locust swarm when the spring crop began to sprout. And behold, the spring crop was uh, after the king's mowing. And it came about when it was finished eating the vegetation of the land that I said, Lord God, please pardon. How can Jacob stand for he is small? The Lord changed his mind about this. It shall not be, said the Lord. He said, the Lord showed me that he was about to clean out all of our food supply. And I begged him not to. And then the Lord said, okay, I won't. Vision number two. Thus the Lord showed me in verse 4, the Lord God was calling to contend with them by fire and consumed the great heap and began to consume the farmland. And I said, Lord God, please stop. How can Jacob stand for he is small? And the Lord God changed his mind about this. This too shall not be, said the Lord God. Now, some of you are going to go right there in the Bible study and people are going to go, I thought it says I am the Lord and I change not. This is not what God is doing. This is a vision of a picture. It's a video that he's watching of something that's happening to explain a story. He's not saying God was going to burn us up. I prayed and God changed his mind. He's saying God showed me the power of a word from a believer concerning coming judgment. That's the point of the story. Don't tell me prayer doesn't change God. Don't tell me prayer doesn't change outcomes. Here's what I know. God told me to pray, and there are places in Scripture like Daniel where I can show you where, where what happened was this I have come in response to your prayers. That means heaven did something because Daniel prayed. Here's the bottom line. The whole point of these first two visions is I just want you to know that a single believer standing in the face of a dark nation can cry out for that nation and save them from their, their, um, the results of their own darkness. That one righteous man and his prayers avail much. One righteous woman can stand up in a dark family and God will turn back the judgment on its head because of that woman who stood up and said, God, please, please, we, I, 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 can't, I can't sit silent. I must cry out to you because of what I see. So there's a point to the story, but the point of the story is not that God changes his mind. The point of the story is that, that you are to speak from a broken heart for the darkness of a situation, knowing God does hear you. What's interesting is you go all the way down to verses 7 through 9, and you see this third illustration. Thus the Lord showed me a vertical wall with a plumb line. What's a plumb line? It's basically a string with a weight at the bottom to see if the wall is straight up and down. Okay. The Lord said to me, what do you see, Amos? I said, a plumb line. And the Lord said, behold, I am about to put a plumb line in the midst of the, my people Israel, and I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be desolated. The sanctuaries of Israel will be laid waste. Then I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam uh, with, the, with the sword. He says, finally, the Lord said to me, this isn't a straight wall, and I can't let it stand. I'm going to act against this crooked wall. Now, I want to jump past 10 through 17 for a minute because there's actually a little story of uh, some priests that get into a scuffle. 
and then get all the way down to summer fruit in chapter 8, because here's another one of his visions. Thus the Lord God showed me there was a basket of summer fruit. And he said, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. What he's looking at is a basket of fruits that are late in the season, ripe fruits, meaning it's been a long time since they harvested. So he says, the songs of the palace will turn to wailing in that day, declares the Lord God. Many will be the corpses in every place. They will cast them forth in silence. Hear this, you who trample the needy, to do away with the humble in the land, saying, when, the, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath so that we may open the wheat market? He says, I got, some, I got a beef with you. You guys can't wait to get out of worship so you can go make more money. So he says, how to make the bushel smaller and the shekel bigger. You, you, you get the picture? Have you gone in and seen what's happened to packets of M&Ms? They, they cut them down by three M&Ms at a time, and they just keep raising the price and cutting it down by three more and three more and three more until, you know, seriously, the other day I got on a flight, and I'm flying to Ohio, and they give me a bag of pretzels, three pretzels. It's hardly worth the plastic it's in. There were three pretzels. I mean, at a certain point, isn't it absurd to even bag them? Just throw a pretzel at me for crying. Just walk through the aisle from one bag going like this. I mean, the bag is this big. There's three tiny little pretzels in it. I mean, I can't wait till they do the peanuts. Three peanuts. One Dorito. I mean, come on. This is people who are just shrinking what they're selling but increasing the price. You're familiar with this. So as to buy the helpless for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. They don't care who they have to hurt in order to get another pair of shoes that we may sell the refuse of the wheat. What we do is we sell the seconds and the bad products. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob. Indeed, I will never forget any of their deeds because of this. Will the land not quake and everyone who dwells in it mourn? Indeed, all of it will rise up like the Nile. It will be tossed about and subside like the Nile of Egypt. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. You're going to see this. You saw it in Joel too, and you're going to see it again in Revelation, um, and you know when six through nineteen, when you have a dark and light problem with each of the three uh, sets of judgments. He says one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to throw the day and night off and the light on and off. I'm going to turn your festivals into mourning, your songs into lamentation, sackcloth on everybody, baldness on every head. I I'm going to make it like a time of mourning for an only son. And the end of it will be a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine in the land, not a famine for bread or thirst for water, but rather for the hearing of the words of the Lord. God said, listen, you have pushed me to the point where I'm just going to not, I'm just going to take away from you my word. I'm just going to take away from you my prophets. I'm going to take away from you the scrolls. People will stagger from sea to sea and from north to east. They will go to, to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. In that day, the beautiful virgins and the young men will faint from thirst, as for those who swear by the guilt of Samaria, who say, Ah, oh, as your God lives, O Dan, as the way of Beersheba lives, they will fall and they will not rise again. So he opens up with the last of his five visions, and this one is the Lord himself. And it says, I saw the Lord standing beside the altar, and he said, Smite the capitals so that the thresholds will shake and break them on the heads of them all, and then I will slay the rest with the sword. They will not have a, uh, a fugitive who will not escape or a refugee who will escape, though they dig into the grave, into Sheol. From there will my hand take them, and though they ascend to heaven, from there I will bring them down though they hide on the summit of Carmel where the most trees are. It's the heaviest forest of the land. I will search them out and take them from there, though they conceal themselves from my sight on the floor of the sea. There I will command a serpent and it will bite them. There is no place you will hide. What God does is he speaks in his powerful voice and he says, I want you to know nothing 
Nothing will conceal you. There is nowhere you can hide. When I bring judgment, it will be total. You will know it, and there will be no relief from it. But that's not the end of the book. The end of the book is the epilogue, and that's in verses 11 to 15. And the final part of the book is about consolation. Because the day of the Lord doesn't end in judgment. It begins in judgment. It begins in shame. (coughs) It says... In that day, I will raise up the fallen booth of David and, the, and wall up its breaches, and I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes who sows the seed when the mountains will drip sweet wine and the hills will be dissolved. He says, it's coming about when you're going to be turning around crops so fast you can barely plant them as fast as you can get them out of the field. And they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards, drink wine, make gardens, and eat their fruit. I will also plant them on their land. I, I want you to underline in verse 15, on their land. And they will not again be uprooted from out of their land, which I have given them, says the Lord your God. He says that at the end of the day of the Lord, in the time of comfort after judgment, Israel will end up in its land and will never be dispossessed of its land again. It'll never be moved from there. A time of judgment will be followed by a time of settlement, which will be time of, followed by fruitfulness and security and endurance. And so the book carries you from the indictments against the world I would use box number one as two judgments. What's the standard of judgment for God to the unbeliever? How he treats the other unbelieving nations. What's the standard of God toward the believing nation? How they treat God and his word. Then I would move to box number two, and I would say there are oracles, and those oracles include God has declared judgment on on Judah and the Jewish people. They have not listened to what I've said. And so I'm going to give them a series of woes that help them understand judgment is coming, it cannot be avoided, and you will pay a price. You think, in woe number one, that judgment is nothing more than happy times. God's going to judge the earth and make us free, but you've forgotten that darkness precedes light. And I will bring judgment, and it will be against you. Then you move to the five visions and the the locust vision. And, and the um, fire vision have in common one thing. I saw God raise up in judgment. He was going to do it today. I cried out to him. He did not do it today. It's not a literal event. It's a vision. He, he said, I want you to know that all that is required, all that is required is righteous people to fall before God and avert judgment. You want to put off the judgment of the country? Then, then get serious about sin and among the righteous, fall before God and cry out. The third one, finally, know that you can't forestall or withhold judgment forever. Sometime that leaning wall's got to be knocked down to put a straight wall in its place. And then after a little fight with some prophets, I saw that the time was late. The summer fruit was coming in. I saw the Lord standing before the altar, and I heard his voice and his mighty uh, power saying, rise up and judge them, and then the final part, the epilogue in 9, 11 through 15, that simply says, it doesn't end in our destruction, it ends in our restoration. It ends in our consolation, it ends in our comfort, it ends in God giving us our land once and for all. But this time, the wall is straight. This time, the heart is right. Jeremiah will go on and say, you won't have to say to another, teach me of God, you will all know me, every one of you. You'll have a personal relationship with me, and you'll have a personal security in your land. That's Amos. Mm -hmm.